Well, thanks, Aaron. Uh, thanks for having me on the workshop today and for hosting. So, um, so my background is kind of, well, let me back up here. So uh, this is a good transition for my program for identifying uh, common plants that we see daily in the landscape. So I think this is a logical and uh, a nice transition from Kevin Rowling's topic uh, because he covered more native shrubs and evergreens and I'm not really covering uh, many of those today. I think I have one or two. So uh, my background in training is really uh, heavier in landscape horticulture and kind of how plants work in more of a designed landscape. And that's really kind of the frame of mind I'm, approach, I'm approaching uh, plants in the landscape usually. Now, more and more I try to see things in an ecological light. And so I try to see how plants fit into the landscape but I'm still thinking kind of in that design uh, kind of uh, mind frame. So I, I'm going to talk today a lot about cultural requirements and kind of these plants that we're talking about, some of them are native and we'll talk a little bit about natives and some of them are non-native, uh, but they're all, none of them are going to be invasive. I'm not going to really say that we should conserve anything that isn't invasive here. So that's really kind of the focus on my talk and I think it'll kind of transition well from Kevin's. And so let's get started here. So what does your backyard look like? Well, maybe your back 40. Is it more of a kind of a woodland, kind of a naturalized area uh, like we see here? Some maybe maybe uh, your backyard is a trail perhaps. I've I've had the pleasure to live behind a green earth trail in Carbondale, so I can say that my backyard looked a little bit like this. But this is a mix of pretty uh, uh, kind of wild, uh, what we would say maybe uh, kind of manage more for natural kind of uh, native plants or kind of let it do what it's going to do with uh, minimal control here. Or maybe it looks a little bit more like this, so it's more of a agrarian, maybe a pasture for grazing or a meadow. Um, or it's just kind of a mode for pasture. So maybe a little bit more controlled and, and uh, maybe just more grasses. Is, this might be what our backyard looks like. Or maybe you have more of a uh, controlled kind of uh, design. Maybe, maybe your backyard is more of an arboretum uh, or maybe a golf course, you know, something like that. So maybe it's a little bit more intentional. Um, or maybe it looks like this, like, like my backyard. So this is the backyard of my office in, in Jackson County. And it's probably the backyard that I spend the most time in. So it's a little bit more haphazard and, and we're doing kind of uh, research and kind of demonstrations and, and um, just trying different things. So it's a little bit more scattered and not quite as uh, planned out. So it could be any mixture of those, but uh, I have a feeling more often it looks a little bit more like this. Um, but regardless of the level of intention of design or, or lack thereof, um, of, of how you're using your landscape, there are a wide range of common plants that we see in the landscape. And um, a lot of the, and, and we see these more than we think. So these common things that are native, if, if we start to think about them, start to uh, maybe be aware of them, they're, they're, they're more prevalent than we think. And so um, some might be more desirable than others, of course. So some of these might not be that desirable, even though they might fall into uh, the category of native. Uh, but some of these might be something we would consider conserving instead of seeing as a nuisance. And so today we'll talk about some of these more common Okay, back on track here. So, okay, so let's just quickly go into depth a little, and I know that you probably have been uh, uh, ear rung about native so far today, but we'll just go through this. Uh, definitions vary a little between agencies and, and sources, but generally in the United States, a native plant occurs naturally in a particular region. Uh, so uh, sometimes ecotypes can exist without human intervention within ecoregions. And a native plant uh, generally was present uh, 
prior to uh, colonization or, or European uh, visit or uh, any kind of um, colonization or discovery of, of North America from the Western world. And eco regions are generally areas that have similar types of uh, environmental resources and environmental conditions. And so in Illinois, this is our Illinois natural regions or also called our natural divisions map. They're synonymous, but uh, here we are in Jackson County and we've got a confluence of uh, five of these. So, so we, we have a lot of diversity in Southern Illinois in general in our, in our eco regions. And so uh, we have a lot of these plants we're looking at today exist in the lower half of Illinois, sometimes not so much in Northern Illinois. So if, if you're Northern Illinois, uh, I'm sorry if we're leaving you out on some of these, but um, some of them are, are for the whole state. So, so there, there'll be a handful that are applicable to, to the whole state. But um, niches or kind of uh, types are really defined and uh, informed by moisture levels. So you're gonna hear me kind of talk about moisture levels quite a bit through these plant selections. And so we have a range uh, kind of, this is kind of a, uh, a sliding scale, a dynamic range here, but the general categories are hydric. So that's very wet areas or, or um, kind of uh, uh, th these are areas that, that, are, that are going to be uh, wetlands sometimes or, or um, close to water and plants are periodically inundated with water in these areas, okay? And then we have mesic. So mesic is somewhere in between. That's, that's generally going to have uh, consistent moisture, adequate soil moisture year round. And then we're getting into a little bit more dry uh, and, and sub -xeric. So moist to dry, maybe a little bit more upland in the environment. And uh, maybe there's a dry period of the year. This might be in a hilly area or on a slope and then kind of the opposite of hydric on the other end of, of the kind of riparian kind of environment, we have really dry or drought resistant uh, areas that tend to be more dry. So if we look at examples in the landscape, more in the prairie or, or uh, kind of uh, higher elevations, maybe plateau, we have things that are kind of drier like sedges, grasses. Uh, then we get in the kind of meadow woodland kind of woodlands with uh, hardwood trees and maybe streams and that's where we get into sort of the hydric mesic all the way to repair, riparian or, or wetland uh, where we're in hydric kind of conditions so uh, and a lot of these native plants they're pretty adaptive so they can they, they can exist in a range somewhere between mesic and and uh, xeric and and some specialists or even adapted to just being in water, like hydric conditions. So we'll look at a few of these. And so we're going to look at some forbs and grasses and ground covers. That's kind of the majority of the plants we're looking at today. And so these first few are actually more cautionary tales. So these are plants that we probably aren't too worried about conserving and may even be plants of concern. So these might be plants that we actually are wanting to uh, remove or, or not really promote in the landscape. These, these are things we want to exclude if we can. Um, but it's interesting because as I mentioned, I have a background in landscape design and landscape horticulture. So in my training and in my, in my career, uh, you know, things like Creeping Jenny, it's always interesting to me, the plants that I was, that, that were once promoted and that I've sold in landscape, uh, in the uh, garden centers, and that, that are still sold in, in garden centers and that, that have traditionally been um, promoted for annual designs and containers, things like this. Let me make sure I'm still connected here. I'm having some connectivity issues, but we'll work with it. Looks like I'm still connected. Okay, so uh, Creeping Jenny or Money Ward here. This is something that when I first started was in our annual uh, herbaceous, um, 
herbaceous training. And this is something that's recommended for, or that was recommended for ground cover containers, uh, annuals. It's, and it's, and it's really kind of got a pretty uh, falling kind of uh, texture and habit and form to it. And it's a, it's an attractive plant. Uh, but uh, it's a plant of concern in, in the Midwest because it can, it can be uh, aggressive and uh, can be kind of um, uh, noxious. It can be a noxious plant. Um, and, it, and it kind of outcompetes other spreading plants. But uh, this one, it, uh, it's a ground spreading plant and it spreads really well in wet areas. Now it doesn't always flower, but when it does, it has uh, a, a lot of these uh, yellow cup-shaped yellow flowers in June. Um, and I say it's a good ground cover for wet areas because it outcompetes other things. And a, a reason that things become uh, noxious or, or weedy, uh, hard to control, is that they spread by rhizomes a lot of times. So those rhizomes, uh, they can survive uh, over winter and uh, that's like a storage of uh, energy storage uh, compartment for the plant or uh, energy storage um, uh, tissue. And uh, it, so trying to pull those out, if any part of that rhizome uh, is, uh, is left, it, it can reproduce out of that rhizome. And it is still sold as um, an ornamental, but considered invasive. So this is one we're probably not too worried about conserving. Now this is one that I see on the, on the roadsides of highways all the time. And for a long time, I wasn't sure what it was, but this is common chicory and it's a perennial non-native and it's really common. Well, in, in, the, in the summer, early summer, uh, this is one of those blue flowers that you see a lot along roadsides in Illinois. Another one is uh, probably uh, spider wart, but um, this one uh, has kind of a bigger flower and looks a little different. Um, and it's, a, it's more blue, I think, but it's, a, it's an attractive flower, uh, but it is a plant of concern. And it's uh, not a very tall growing uh, flower, but it gets up to about three feet. And so it's uh, hardy from uh, Northern Illinois all the way to Southern Illinois. And uh, maybe one of the reasons that it's so adaptive is that it can grow in alkaline soils. It prefers kind of uh, uh, more kind of stressful areas where other plants don't do so well. So it does well in clay and wet soils can handle uh, water. So it, standing in water, so it can grow in ditches and, and uh, uh, sway, uh, bio swales and things like that, um, highway medians. Uh, but it blooms uh, in early summer through fall. So it has a long bloom period as well. And it has these uh, sh showy blue flowers on, on uh, terminal stalks. Now you may have heard of chicory. Chicory is uh, sold, uh, uh, marketed as a coffee substitute in, in chicory coffee. So it's, it's, a, it's a commodity thing that's still, you know, used as, a, as an agricultural crop. I mean, it's not very popular, but, there, but chicory coffee is still a uh, a um, uh, marketed uh, uh, product, uh, but again, spreads by rhizomes and can be significantly weedy. Uh, I'm not sure if it's on the invasive list in Illinois, but it is uh, considered a plant of concern. And so it can be found in, in a lot of different environments in the landscape. So this one you might not want to conserve. And one more that might be a plant of concern more than a plant of conservation. Uh, this is uh, Perilla uh, frutescens, and its common name is beefsteak plant, but it's also closely related to an herb that's kind of popular in the last couple of years called shiso. Um, but this is non native, its home range is uh, in Asia, and it's commonly, it's common in Southern Illinois and it's regarded as a weed. So it gets up to about five feet by three feet. And this time of year, it's got these um, kind of uh, spikelets or racemes with tiny little pinkish white flowers. And uh, so it blooms in early fall. And again, this is tolerant of a wide range of conditions. And look at that range of zones. So it, it's growing up in, in uh, the uh, the prairie land of Canada all the way down to southern United, southern uh, North America. So huge range and um, 
it is cultivated and sold in uh, garden centers. Now the, the specific species I think is maybe different, but it's the same genus. And that shiso, um, it's, a, it's an herb that's used in culinary, in culinary uh, applications, but uh, it's not one that I, I think we need to be thinking of, of protecting or, or, or con and conserving in any way really. Um, and uh, it grows in wet areas and uh, can kind of outcompete other things that we'd rather have there. Now, from here on in, we're talking about things that we actually might be interested in keeping around and some useful things. So we're going to look at some ground cover and grasses here. So this is Mondo grass and this is a non-native, but it's not a plant of concern. It's not uh, escaped or, or overly aggressive. It is a good ground cover and it, it eventually kind of spreads out to about a foot, a foot and a half. Um, it's desirable because it's drought tolerant. So this is in kind of a plaza out in, out in some hardscaping. Um, it really doesn't get much water except maybe five or six years ago when I was in charge of it and watered it during the summer. I don't think it gets watered anymore and it survived and I've seen it slowly spread in this confined space and, and, and be a nice uh, aesthetic looking uh, ground cover. And it's, um, and it kind of turns brown during the, during the winter, but then it greens up in the summer. And it has a uh, small uh, purple stalks or racemes of flowers in June, but it's more about the, the ground cover and the foliage. Uh, and it is shade tolerant, shade tolerant, drought tolerant. Uh, it's uh, tolerant to juglone, which is an allelopathic compound from black walnut. Um, and so we'll look at a few other things that have that quality to it. So black walnut uh, produces a chemical that suppresses other vegetation growing under it. And so that's why a lot of times in a landscape, people will have black walnut and they can't figure out why their grass won't grow. A lot of times it's that allelopathic activity and other trees do that as well to some extent. Um, but this is low maintenance, very shade tolerant, good ground cover. Okay, so this is closely related to Mondo grass. This is lily turf or monkey grass. It's also called or liriope. And it is full sun to part shade, gets about uh, 0.5, one point, one and a half feet to one and a half feet kind of uh, found, uh, uh, kind of uh, cascading or um, fountain kind of uh, uh, habit to it. And uh, it's uh, hardy up to zone five and down to about zone uh, 10. So, and it's a non-native again, this is, this is not a native, but it's one that um, has some uh, redeeming qualities to it. And, and this one on the, on the right of the screen is a variegated form, and then it also has um, non-variegated here, with a little bit more uh, slender leaves or blades. And it, it does have kind of more of a noticeable raceme of flowers in mid-summer. Um, and again, very tolerant of, of uh, it's tolerant of shade, heat, uh, heat stress, drought, and um, rabbit and deer tolerant as well. So it's, a, it, it's got some benefits to it that, that make it a desirable plant for the landscape and one that we probably see all the time and just aren't really aware of it. So it's one of these that you don't appreciate it until, until you're aware of it. But it spreads by rhizomes, so uh, you can split this up every couple years and um, kind of forms these grassy mounds. So it's good for massing. It's really good for borders, massings, these kind of things. And uh, okay, now we're getting into some natives here and uh, I'll try to hurry up so we can get through everything. And so this is Indian sea oats or northern sea oats, and there's even, I think there's another common name for it, but the Indian sea oats, northern sea oats, inland sea oats, all of those. Uh, Illinois native, um, and it gets up to five feet tall by about 2.5 feet spread. And it is deer resistant, rabbit resistant, uh, again, black walnut resistant, shade tolerant, can handle poor soils. But the really neat feature of these, the noticeable feature is these uh, spikelets that form in late summer. And uh, they, they kind of just have this very noticeable and uh, characteristic quality to them, uh, very distinguishable in the landscape. And they really have a neat winter interest too. 
uh, they, they can kind of take over an area. In these beds here, they've really uh, done well to establish themselves, maybe a little bit too well, because they, they, they do spread by clumping, uh, so they kind of slowly spread out from the base, but they also uh, reseed heavily. And so they're good for borders, massings, um, and uh, they, they do kind of tend to, in the, in the wild, they prefer more moist areas along uh, the edges of woods and along stream banks. Oh, this is uh, Casmanthium latifolium. So that's a typo. This is Indian grass. Um, disregard that. This is Indian grass that we're looking at here. And Indian grass gets uh, quite a bit taller than that. It gets, um, I mean, six, seven feet tall sometimes and uh, spreads about three or four feet, five feet even. And its hardiness zone is from uh, Northern Illinois down to uh, past Southern Illinois. So it's, it's, it's common throughout uh, the state. Uh, very drought, erosion tolerant, tolerates dry soils, shallow rocky soils. Uh, and it, it's tolerant of air pollution. So for that reason, it's really common. I see this so much in Missouri too, uh, along roadsides, along the, along the uh, shoulders and along the uh, uh, margins. Um, it's just everywhere. It's so, it's so prevalent. And uh, for those reasons, it's very tolerant of, of being around a highway. Um, but it has these kind of attractive spikelets that form in late summer through fall. And it also has a nice winter interest, but it does kind of tend to flop over a little bit if it's um, if it's in like a wetter area. It seems to get really tall and then start to start to flop. Um, but it's a really nice addition for pollinator and prairie gardens. Uh, pollinators use this quite a bit, actually. Um, uh, birds, I think, use it, and uh, a couple different maybe kind of ground bees use it for habitat. Um, and so also it's a, it's a great prairie garden plant and it's found in meadows, open woods and really common along highways. Okay, so this is an annual. This is a non-native annual, but it's very common. And this is another one of these annuals from uh, Annual uh, Landscape Design 101. Uh, but this one it doesn't have a, a real uh, issue with uh, being uh, troublesome. Or, or being uh, noxious uh, because it's annual, so it's frost killed. Now you see that's how it reproduces each year, but it's this kind of small, uh, short growing plant. Uh, it doesn't get much more than two feet or so, uh, but it does have a wide range where it behaves as an annual, where it, where it uh, can survive. And uh, it's deer and rabbit resistant and it blooms from June to frost, but it has these neat little almost uh, neon purple uh, lavender showy little clumps of uh, kind of fuzzy or flossy purple flowers. So it really kind of pops out in the landscape and um, but it's naturalized in our area. So it's and it's used quite often in planned gardens along pathways, walkways, containers, these kind of things. But um, the place you'll find them out in the field is probably in wetter areas uh, near near water. All right, this is common bone set, uh, Eupatorium perfoli perfoliatum. And it is an Illinois native and uh, gets about, gets pretty tall, gets up to six feet by about three feet. And it's very low maintenance, tolerant of a lot of uh, adverse conditions. So this makes it a good uh, option for a rain garden, can really do clay and wet soil as well. Very water tolerant. So it starts blooming in late summer, early fall. So right about now it's, it's blooming um, and it has very nice showy clumps of small fluffy white flowers and it spreads by rhizomes. So it's a great prairie pollinator plant and it attracts a wide range of insects and um, pollinator species. So it's really, and it's also, as I mentioned, good for rain gardens. So we're gonna find this in, in, where, in wetter areas uh, it, uh, it likes areas of kind of uh, high organic matter, um, but uh, it can also be found uh, kind of in floodplains and, uh, and definitely in ditches as well or on the edge of, of 
a, a woodland maybe near, near a road is where we might find this. And so bone set, it's, it has historical medicinal uses. It, it was used for ailments and maybe if you had a, an, like a, a, a minor injury. And so here we have another, this is very common. We see this all over the place. And uh, the common name or the scientific name is uh, Solidago altissima. And it's also synonymous with Canadensis, so it seems that both of those are referring to either tall, late, or giant goldenrod. And uh, it is, it is uh, spread all over Illinois in the Midwest. And it gets quite tall here, so uh, this is out at uh, the Wren Lake Pollinator Garden in Franklin County, and this is about eight feet by eight foot uh, tall, so quite a couple feet above my head. And uh, it's deer tolerant, clay, wet soil tolerant, um, uh, very, very tolerant of a wide range of conditions again. So it grows in, uh, uh, you know, it grows in floodplains, uh, poorly drained areas, wetlands, ditches, any place that uh, it can, it can find a spot to grow. So for that reason, it's considered a little bit weedy actually. And, you, and if you do have it in a, in a rain garden or a pollinator garden, it may take some control. You may need to uh, dig some of it out or kind of trim it back if you want to try to get rid of some of the, uh, the seeds that it reproduces and spreads. So um, this one can get a little bit out of hand, but it is a native and it does have uh, ecological quality to it. Um, it's a good pollinator plant. And it is, it is pretty. It's got its own kind of uh, distinct look to it. And here we have uh, wingstem. This is uh, ver Verbicina alternifolia, wingstem. It's also commonly called yellow ironweed, and it's an Illinois native. And this is more common in Southern Illinois, so maybe not so common in the Northern part of the state, but it is hardy up to zone four. And it gets up to about four feet, I would say. The, the one here in this picture is about four feet tall and about two foot spread. Uh, and it's very tolerant of wet soils, thrives, and it really does well in, in moist, full sun areas. So where it gets more sun, it's going to do better. And so it's blooming right now, late summer, early fall. And it has kind of these bright yellow daisy. This is an aster, so it has uh, kind of daisy-like flowers with drooping rays. Sometimes it doesn't have any rays on it. This one on the top here, maybe I can get my laser pointer. So, so here uh, it's lost some of its rays, but down here, this is what it would look like with more of the rays on it. And then it's got the disc flowers on here that are a little more spiky looking. But it's called wing stem because uh, the main stem is winged. So it's got kind of uh, folded edges to it and it's kind of got a hairy wing stem. So it's pretty straightforward common name and uh, it attracts insects and butterflies. So, so it's ecological. Uh, ecologically important. And so it can be found in woodland areas near paths, near water, woodland borders, ditches, just about anywhere in, in a more kind of a naturalized setting. And here we're looking at false aster, uh, Boltonia asteroides. This is another native aster, Illinois native, and again, more common in the lower half of southern Illinois, and it gets up to seven feet, about uh, seven foot spread, and it's kind of hard to tell where one plant starts and another begins, because they kind of grow in these giant uh, uh, mounds, so, so, but uh, generally about six by five spread, and uh, tolerant of, again, so these, these plants are common because they're, they're able to uh, adapt to these really common conditions that we have here, like uh, clay and wet soils. And it blooms from summer, uh, late summer to September, and it's just right now covered in just a, kind of a wave of, of these small uh, white and yellow daisies. And they can even be kind of pinkish to, to white and uh, attracts butterflies and insects. Uh, so it tends to get taller in wetter, shadier spots. Um, but in sunnier spots, uh, sunny dry spots, it actually stays shorter. So 
I've got this on uh, the green roof at SIUC where I, where I also have some, some research going on. So I noticed it up there and um, we'll take a look at that here. And we can see kind of some of the different pollinators that it attracts as well. So on the, on the green roof where it's a lot hotter and drier, I'd say it's, it only gets to about three feet and not nearly as, as, as abundant and uh, established. But uh, we can just see a few different pollinators here, some, some kind of uh, bees here, and I'm not even sure what this guy is. Uh, I'll, if anybody has any uh, suggestion or, or insight on that, I'd be interested. But uh, definitely a lot of pollinators are visiting there. Okay. And now we've got orange jewelweed. This is a uh, water loving uh, native and it's uh, a lot more common in Southern Illinois. Uh, and this is an annual. So uh, when we think of natives, we're commonly thinking of uh, forbs and uh, perennials and uh, shrubs and woody kind of things. Not so much annuals, but this is an annual. So it, it, it reseeds itself. And the way it reseeds itself is interesting. It's got one of these seed pods that kind of explode open and shoot seeds uh, in all directions all around it. So, so it really can uh, establish and, and create its own little groves. But it gets up to about five feet tall by about 2.5 feet. And it's found throughout North America. Uh, and uh, it's very tolerant of water. So it can stand in water for uh, in up to two weeks. Or in, and in this case, this is, this is right on the water's edge. So it really likes being in wetter areas and in clay soils. And so it's blooming right now and it's got these uh, very orange showy uh, flowers on kind of delicate, easily broken stalks, but, uh, and it's visited by lots of different pollinators and uh, also kind of like shadier areas where it stays moist and shady. Um, but if you have a wetter area, this might be a good addition for a pollinator garden or a rain garden. Um, and so jewelweed, um, I've, I've also seen, I, it's, the, the flower is kind of reminiscent of an orange jewel, but if you take the leaf and put it under water, it also kind of shimmers in a way that, that maybe you could say is almost jewel-like. And then we have pokeweed. So see the, the, the terminology here, weed. So it, over the course of history, these have been deemed as, as, as less desirable, but they're, they're native and they have their place in, in our ecosystems. Um, they've been here longer than a lot of us have. So, so uh, this is an Illinois native and uh, regarded as a weed, still regarded as a weed, um, but it does have its ecological value to it. It's, it's, it's highly trafficked by a lot of different birds and a few different bees, um, but it gets pretty tall, gets up to about 10 feet by four feet and it's killed off in, in the winter um, and comes back uh, from uh, its taproot in the following year. Um, but it's really tolerant. It can grow just about anywhere. So meadows, woodlands, thickets, uh, ditches, it, it's happy in, in, a, in kind of distressed areas, probably even more than the nicer areas. Um, but right now it's got, it's got this profusion of these kind of dark berries on it and really kind of vibrant, uh, tissue on the stems, uh, the, uh, the stems and, and, uh, and the kind of bract or the, uh, the branches on it have, have kind of this bright fuchsia color to it. So it really stands out in the landscape. It's easy to spot. And now we have a, just a few trees and shrubs here. And, and this one is pretty common in Southern Illinois, maybe not so common, but it's one of my favorites and I, I couldn't help myself. So I put it in here and this is the beauty berry. So this is Calicarpa Americana and it's the only native beauty berry in the US and it's kind of limited in its range, but its range is kind of just on the edge here in Southern Illinois. So it can get up to six by six feet, tolerant of hot, dry conditions, humid conditions, clay. Um, so it suits itself well for Southern Illinois. And it has kind of small uh, lavender flowers in June that are actually pretty attractive and, and, and it's, and it, it kind of has this full season interest. So it's got kind of these really attractive lavender flowers on these arching branches. And then this time of year, it's just loaded with these kind of magenta berries, uh, clumps of magenta berries. And it's very attractive to birds and bees. Uh, and uh, so, it, so it does have ecological value. 
and it can be pruned back, unlike a lot of other, uh, it can be pruned back heavily in the spring, unlike a lot of other native plants, they don't like to be heavily pruned. And uh, lots of uses in like a woodland or natural kind of native plant garden uh, can be found in, in the wild and kind of understories and in thickets or hammocks. So hammocks, I, I thought, isn't a hammock something you take a nap in? But that's kind of another word for like an isolated thicket in, in a woods. And this one is really cool too. And it's one you might not think of quite as much or really even know what you're looking at if you see it in the woods. And this is uh, gray dogwood. This is uh, our native gray dogwood. And it's primarily found in, in Illinois, in Southern Illinois. And it's more of a tree shrub kind of thing. It can get up to 15 by 15 feet, but uh, probably this one's probably about eight feet tall. Uh, and it's deer tolerant, uh, can tolerate uh, a wide range of conditions, but is probably happiest in mesic areas. And so right now it's got these bunches of white flowers, but in the spring on these uh, corums, it, it kind of has bunches of small white flowers. So they're not like the big uh, petaled uh, dogwood flowers that are a lot smaller. But it, it also has a good fall color and it's got this kind of attractive um, branch color here too. It's kind of got that same bright uh, fuchsia color almost that the, uh, choke, or the, the uh, pokeberry has. And uh, it's also a good landscape shrub. So this really could lend itself well to along a, a border or as a massing or kind of a, a, a grouping of shrubs in kind of a natural kind of garden or landscape. And in, in nature, it just grows in a, in a wide range of conditions in degraded areas where it might be pretty well suited um, in woodland areas, uh, glades, roadsides, very common. And kind of wrapping up here. So pawpaw, this is uh, a really neat kind of, I just have to put this in here. Uh, this is uh, one of our really unique native fruit trees found in, uh, commonly found in Southern Illinois, not so much Northern Illinois. Uh, it can get up to 30 by 30 feet tall. And uh, it's uh, an easy, plant to grow in our, in our environment. It's really low maintenance and it tolerates clay and wet soils. It, it likes to be in kind of these uh, uh, marginal wet kind of areas. And it really likes shade. It, it does, it's, it's suited for understory uh, shady wet conditions. And um, in the spring, in May, it's kind of got this interesting purple flower that has a punch. Hopefully we can get through this without that happening again. So, uh, okay, I think, I, I, I don't know where that dropped off, but closing out here, um, yeah, this is what pawpaws look like here. And this is kind of the harvest that I got a couple days ago. Is that about where we left off there? Yep. Okay. Now we're, we've got one bonus plant here. Now, just to yourselves, can you guess if this is a... Uh, highly desirable, very rare, valuable, e ecological, ecologically valuable native plant, or is it an invasive plant? So I'll give you a minute to ponder that one. So this, this is Lespediza uh, cuny, cuneate, or, or Cerecia Lespediza, it's also called Cerecia. And this is a really problematic noxious weed and it's also uh, listed as an invasive by the USDA and, and by uh, other agencies, the IDNR. Um, so it's, it's one that uh, it was probably introduced at some point for some reason and, and now it's a real issue for, for prairie plants especially. So that is our, not, not a friendly one, not one that we'd care to conserve. And so, uh, so talking about some of these native plants, um, a lot of these things can be resourced from uh, local plant sales. So uh, Green Earth and Illinois Native Plant Society have a plant sale coming up on October 3rd at 9 a.m. So for something like beautyberry or pawpaw, you know, some of these weirder things, you might be able to find these at, a, at the plant sale. Uh, 
Uh, and so talking about kind of difficult conditions in the landscape, uh, the Missouri Botanical Garden has a really good resource, gardeninghelp.org. And you can kind of go down into the rabbit hole here and they've got such specific recommendations for how to landscape for heavy clay, wet soils in shade. And, and uh, I think it's just a great resource. I use it quite a bit. So uh, it's something to look into. And then this is just one of the resources I use to research uh, native plants and uh, especially plant native plants in Illinois. And uh, for native Illinois or Midwest plants, these are some resources here that I use. I think they're, they're good online retail sources if you can't get it locally. And so if you're, if you're interested in getting these resources, I think these, this whole presentation will be on YouTube, but um, if, you, if you message me, I'd be happy to send you these resources as well. Uh, that's my email address there um, and my contact info. So if there's any other uh, follow-up questions, feel free to get a hold of me. So uh, sorry for the interruptions there, but we got through it. So uh, I'd say we can answer any questions now. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Austin. We have had several questions come in, and I want to encourage um, uh, any, any people, the audience, to answer to ask any other questions through the chat box while we're talking here. Uh, someone asked Austin for a good low growing ground cover. Um, kind of what's your recommendation for that? Oh, it depends on the kind of the, you know, the environmental conditions. So is, was it full sun? Is it, is it shade? Is it part shade? Um, or, you know, and, and also kind of what are they wanting out of it? Is it going to be, is it going to be walked through? Is it going to be more, uh, just in an area that's kind of out of out of the way. There's a lot of things. Um, and are they wanting something more native? Are they, you know, um, it, so is there, there's just a lot of options and that's something I would, I would, I could uh, send them, that's something I'd like to follow up with them on to figure out kind of more what they're looking for. But uh, for, you know, for, for native kind of things, it, it is a little bit more limited for ground covers, um, kind of low growing things. Uh, some of those tend to be kind of short-lived too. So, um, but if they'd like to follow up with me, I'd, I'd like to get back to them on that one. Okay, great. Um, a similar question, but with a little bit different of, a, of a, a reason here. People are asking about covers, ground covers, or plants for immediate erosion control, and particularly looking at, you know, native plants for that. Again, it, it depends on the site condition. So, um, grasses are good, but they're not necessarily ground covers. If the conditions are right, they might be able to use something like uh, buffalo grass. If it's in that area, uh, that could be a good native ground cover to help kind of uh, hold the soil a little bit and kind of uh, secure the secure the the soil and stop stop some of that erosion from going on. Um, gosh, you know trying to think of all those different ground covers right now. And after going through all my other plants, it's, it's hard to come up with a good answer, but um, uh, that's another one that I'd be happy to kind of follow up with them on. The one that comes to mind is buffalo grass for, for a quick kind of coverage. Um, but uh, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd be happy to kind of get back to them on that one. Okay. Um, there was a bit of discussion about goldenrods um, when you were talking about the you know, the benefits of goldenrods and, and definitely their pollinators, but some people were asking about their tendency to take over, um, to spread or to kind of even crowd out of, of, of plantings. Can you speak on that a little bit on other different types of goldenrod that may, may or may not run or, or is that a problem with goldenrod to kind of taken over a little bit? Um, yeah, they, they can be aggressive. There is a shorter, uh, variety of goldenrod. Um, forget the name of it, but it's a different species and it's it's shorter and it does grow native in our area, but it's not nearly as common as the tall or giant or late goldenrod. That's the most, that's the one you pretty much see everywhere. And so if you're wanting to control it, uh, you can dig it up, cut it back. Uh, one thing to really get it under control and stop it from spreading quite as much 
is to uh, cut it, cut off the, the flowers and seeds before they mature. Um, so uh, this time of year, kind of cutting it back before it drops uh, a ton of seed, uh, that's, a, that's a way that it spreads. Um, and so those are some ways to get it under control. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you want to just get rid of it completely, that's, that's um, probably easier in a smaller space in a larger area where there's an existing seed bank that could be a little more challenged. That might take uh, some, some more drastic measures, but kind of just in a kind of a garden setting uh, or in a landscape setting, you could probably dig them up or cut them back to, or mow them down to get some control over it. Okay, great. Um, thinking about just landowners that have plants in their backyard, or like you said, in their back 40, that they don't know what they are. What is your approach or what is your recommendation for their approach for starting to resources or ways to kind of learn to identify these plants? Um, how do you, what do you recommend somebody um, does just to kind of get started on, on plant ID? Well, you know, it, it's, it's, it's something that you can use a field guide for like a dichotomous key and uh, there's lots of different keys out there for native plants, for Illinois native plants. Um, and you just kind of have to practice it and it kind of keys things out. So what's the, what's the foliage pattern? Um, kind of, is it, uh, is it pinnate or bipinnate? What's the, the leaf structure, you know? What's the leaf shape? Um, what's the stem shape? Is it square stem? So, so these are all kind of if, if this, then this kind of thing, and, and it kind of helps you narrow down what it is. But uh, it, it, it's one of these kind of, uh, I guess, uh, iterative things where you just kind of learn as you go, and I, I learn as I go. Um, but uh, kind of getting a basic understanding of botany, I think, is, is, a, good, is a good thing to, to help with uh, any kind of ID. And um, there's, there's the cheating way, too, which is the phone apps. Um, and, and I think... Um, those work pretty well. And if anything, they're a good starting point. They give you a good suggestion of what it could be to kind of lead you in the right direction. But um, uh, if you want to, to really be more kind of accurate than, than a, a, a dichotomous key is a good place to start. Um, and I would look for one that's kind of focused on uh, Illinois native plants. 